lot of people in our community yeah. have different subtypes of OCD, such as um, ROCD, such as HOCD, such as uh, contamination OCD, scrupulosity, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Do certain um, subtypes respond better to certain levels of treatment, or do you see, um, like for example, let's say if somebody has contamination OCD, do they have more benefit going to residential knowing that they can control maybe how, how long they shower or yeah. the locks on the door versus somebody who maybe who has yeah. intrusive thoughts that are um, harm based in nature? I'll tell you, I, I got to say that'd be a very case by case experience. I haven't seen it in terms of subtype does better or, or not at, at a certain level, but uh, someone who might be doing all that showering or doing all the bathroom stuff whose family is just can't kind of disengage the emotional part of it sure. like we can. They do really well at a residential sure. coming in because because we can look, approach it from a very non emotional point of view, just a very you know black and white all or nothing kind of experience of sure. let's take a look at what you're doing in the bathroom, let's work on getting you out of there. Sure. You know, uh, so I would say there's so much case by case in that. Here, here's another question, just because mm -hmm. this is very interesting, in regards to people with the intrusive thoughts that are typically taboo in nature or what oftentimes are deemed puro, yeah. right? they have the mm -hmm. mental compulsions that sure. come with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've seen typically because a lot of those you know thoughts are very difficult to experience. A lot of times, people with the condition will also self-medicate. Yeah. So I know one of the specialties at Amita is um, treating comorbid OCD as well as substance use disorders. Right. Um, so how do you all manage that in the residential setting? Just out of curiosity. Sure. So we do some cross-tracking between the two programs. So because we have an anxiety OCD side and we have a substance abuse side, we can manage all of that at the same time. Almost any other residential is going to tell you you need to be sober for 30 to 60 days before you can come really? in. Whereas we say, come on in, and no we're going to treat both of them at the same time. Oh. So the good pieces you're going to get from the substance abuse side, the motivational interviewing, there's 12-step availability, there's cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness, sure. all those things that are important in helping people start to live a values-based life where sure. my value is to not be using substances but to right. actually be fully functioning in the life that I want to sure. live. And also then combining that with being able on uh, whatever cross-tracking days you're doing to do exposure and response really. prevention therapy too. Really. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, I, I just recently read a stat that said six to 12% of all substance use disorder cases suffer with comorbid OCD. Not surprising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and most of those those patients can't get better unless they utilize exposure response prevention treatment too, in addition to right. their substance use disorder treatment. So the fact that you're basically allowing people to come in the first day and get both yeah. is huge to the overall healthcare system. And the problem that's been happening in the treatment centers and across the board lately uh, with that is that if you tell someone you've got to stop your substance use for 30 days before we're going to treat your OCD, you're basically saying we're taking away your number one coping strategy that you've learned to use, but we're not giving you anything else to do in 30 days. You're just going to have to suffer with that. Wow. That's tough. Right. I mean, imagine that, what right. that would be like, right? Right. I mm -hmm. can't imagine. Yeah. I, um, wow. But I just think that's from a mission standpoint, it's like really special with what you're doing. It's important for us. And then, of course, in all of that, with whatever uh, level, once you're out of residential, because you don't have your phones with you, but the No CD app becomes very important as a nice tool to be an add-on to sure. PHP, IOP, individual therapy, things like that as well. Too. Definitely. And you know, we're basically saying to it, and our goal is, and I know you alluded to this before, is we want to ensure that we can be the outpatient side. So no matter where you live, uh, no matter how much money you make, no matter your um, you know, ethnic background, you know, whatever, right? Whatever you, you can come in and get mm -hmm. care. That's evidence-based. Mm -hmm. And we can then also help you kind of connect to different levels of care if you're too severe, right? Mm -hmm. So our goal is we want to help you work the system and, and connect to, let's say, the PHP level if, if you just are too severe for us. Um, at the same time, if, if you are, you know, kind of as, as Dr. McGrath mentioned, graduate from IOP or PHP, you can also step down back to us if you're never alone. So the idea is this population of patients um, that I'm personally a part of, um, as well as others on our team, no matter where you live or what time of day, you can get access to evidence-based support and, tr and therapy. Um, and so I think that's really special. So we know to, in order to really manage this population of people successfully, we need to connect the dots and um, we need to offer evidence-based treatment that is condition specific. Right. And um, so what right now we're doing is we're growing our network. So we're scaling our network um, of 
ERP trained providers to all 50 states. And we're really excited to do that because our, our goal is by doing that, we'll be able to get people to the right form of care much faster and also change their life much faster. Just in the way speed is a priority for you as well with the yeah. getting people in the door for residential if they have both OCD and substance use disorder day one versus making them, you know, be, um, or making them get the substance use disorder treatment first. Yeah. So, right. And uh, you and I have worked with Margaret Sissa on Riley's Wish. And, right. You know, this, this is what killed her son, unfortunately. He, he overdosed. Uh, yeah. And he was trying to treat his OCD with substances. And he was trying to do therapy too. And he was even studying to be a therapist. And right. it still, it took his life. And right. I don't want to see another person die. Right. I just don't want to ever see that happen again. So. Well, and you know, too, just given the fact that this condition, doesn't surface as OCD, it'll surface in the ER as a right. substance use disorder, or it'll surface mm -hmm. as um, se severe major depressive disorder. People don't realize that it's causing that type of, of actions in society and it's causing people to become really severe. And so I think just going back to what we said before, getting that awareness out, showing the size of this problem can be you know, huge in preventing people from getting to that point. And so um, we know too, for example, we just saw a stat the other day, People with OCD are 10 times more likely to um, die by suicide than the average person. And it's just simply because there's very little evidence-based treatment for it. You'll have you know, a population of people, about 1.2 million, yet only 800 OCD patients of an entire population will be identified. Yeah. And so it's just, we, you know, we, have to, we have to fix that, right? And so um, I think that's what you're doing in providing levels of care is really important. And one of your missions I know is to help providers learn that they've got a lot more people with OCD on their books than they know they do. Right. Mm -hmm. 